we, we met about 25 years ago, 20 years ago, at a workshop at Windstar, and where I was doing sheet mulching and introducing permaculture to, to the biointensive people over at John Denver's, uh, you know, big gardens over there. They had, a, they had lots of stuff going on over there. And then it, um, Michael took a workshop there, and there, he's been doing variation on his on sheet mulching in his backyard uh, on Purpose Drive. And has a nice, very a nice, productive, small you know, postage stamp type of garden, which is very well organized. There's a little little lawn right in the middle, and then all these beds around it, and, and two big fruit trees that he's been uh, nurturing uh, for a long, long time. And then we have this project called the Heritage Fruit Tree Preser Preservation Project that we've been doing together. And then um, we're equal partners in the ecosystems design. Uh, I started that pro that company as an S Corp, and then he he bought half of the stock, and so we have got. Uh, I think the last year we probably the last two years we did about a uh, million dollars in in project grow out in you know, total projects, and then now we have contracts to do a, close to another million dollars in the next two years. And some of, he's going to show you some of the projects we're working on. And, um, that's it. Yay. Thanks, Jerome. Yeah. Um, thanks, everybody, for having me. And oh, yeah, this is another project that we put together. For the, for the <laughs> mostly help fund this and, and yeah. design it and get it off the ground. And, uh, and thanks for feeding me such a great dinner. That was really, really nice. And, uh, to start off with, um, uh, when Jerome says a million dollars, that's uh, construction value. So, right. Um, you know, but but there's uh, there's more and more interest in this, and I'm fascinated with this market that we're in, where everyone, no matter how much money they have, seems very very careful about how they're going to spend it. So, we're trying very very much so to uh, increase the the performance of the greenhouses that we're designing um, and to drive while we're driving the price down. Of course, we, our first big client, we started off way out of bounds in the high area because it was a really custom uh, greenhouse. I'm not going to spend much any time on that one. It's in Steamboat Springs. It's beautiful. It works great. Uh, and, um, you know, but it's more like a, a custom home inside. Um, but. This is the Roaring Fork High School Growing Dome. Growing Dome is manufactured by Growing Spaces out of Pagosa Springs. Many of you are probably familiar with them. Yep. This is their 42-foot diameter model. And uh, Jerome really had this idea in mind that we need to get one of the schools uh, to establish a, a, a facility for teaching permaculture on the valley floor. And we did get a, a project of a 22-foot dome with Susie Ellison, the science teacher at Yampa Mountain High School, but that's just a little tiny um, uh, charter school in Glenwood Springs. We then got a, 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 an arrangement, a unanimous, unanimously, the school board of the RE1 public school district uh, voted to uh, do a deal with us at the Roaring Fork High School, their brand new school where they had, they have acres around it. And so, they gave us this half acre parcel that's fenced for the dome and the gardens around it and another acre and a half on the hillside and it's we have water and everything so we're we've we've completed last year the dome and the half acre uh, fenced garden and this is uh, some of the grain trials we have around it so um and inside it's a beautiful polyculture with uh all kinds of I, I, this is a detail shot i one of the beds is a polyculture yeah, one of the beds in polyculture, but there's all, every bed uh, has you know, tomatoes and artichokes and, uh, you know, and cucumbers and there's two fish tanks and everything, and it's really nice. And then outside, or I'm sorry, the, let me go into how the, the, the domes work. This is a drawing of a smaller dome where we're doing the tubing method to introduce warm, moist air into the soil. Uh, and this tubing layout comes from John Crickshank's original designs where he would use just 
a single vertical riser, a bunch of hole, punch a hole, bunch of holes in it, and plug all the tubes in and etc. We're using for the the larger we get, the more we find we need a horizontal manifold the same diameter as the riser underground. So, but I just wanted to show you this one. Uh, and that's the way I did Pele. That's the way right. I did it with a single box in the middle right. of the greenhouse. But and I'm then show John you. came in. Yeah, and then John came and, and developed this. And I like the way that this works because you can because you can get a big fan on it, and then you can use adjustable speed on the fan to deliver the best performance that you might get. I have a really elementary question. What's a horizontal manifold mean? I'm going to show you. Okay. Uh, so this is um, this is just a look at the top-down view, the water tank, and and the tubing underground, and that's how we figure out the tubing. We build the model in SketchUp. And uh, then I can tell exactly how long each tube needs to be. They just cut them to length, lay them out, and that's how they look on the ground. The, the fans, we figured out how to put our fans inside, the, um, inside of these tubes uh, so that you can, you know, with, with springs and eye screws on the inside of the tube. And the nice thing about that is that it, uh, it allows us to uh, make the the fans quieter. We drill holes in the in the vertical riser if we're doing that method, or in this case it was a manifold, a horizontal manifold. And here's how I'll show you how that works. This is an intake riser, so we drop a fan down inside of that. The ground, of course, is going to be up around here when we're done. And then there's this horizontal manifold. So we have a riser pumping air into a horizontal manifold, and then we have all those holes that I just showed you here um, drilled into the horizontal manifold and then we plug all these tubes in there. And you can see some of the holes on this one. So this is an intake. The air moves this way and then it moves down the tubes and then it moves this way and out here. So the distance the air travels is the same speed in every tube and it's the same distance from here to there in, in, uh, because it goes in that alternate way. And then we just bury that in lots of soil, three layers of tubing. And, uh, and then when it's all covered, you forget all about it. And you can always go look down in the uh, exhaust tube and see and feel what temperature the climate battery is at. This is a, a slightly bigger project. This is the TCI Lane Ranch, a big rectangular house that was uh, built for a subdivision of solar homes. And uh, this will be the indoor community garden, and it will be surrounded by outdoor community gardens. Uh, this is, again, that same idea. We have four intake fans here uh, into different manifolds, feeding tubes, and coming out two um, risers, two exhaust risers that are slightly bigger in diameter. The, uh, the air does accelerate out these. Um, and that's kind of uh, fun because it's really, it really is, uh, it tends to make it cooler. And uh, one of the things that uh, in Steamboat, um, the crew would hang their beer in the exit. It didn't uh, <laughs> get quite that cold, but <laughs> and, uh, well, at the end of the day, they were, you know, they'd have a cool one, you yeah. know. 60 degree beer. Uh. <laughs> well, in, in, in England, Those guys you weren't drink, You don't drink ice beer. Anymore, That's right. Right. <laughs> so anyway, this is the uh, battery being built at TCI. Uh, this is a. Uh, this is we're on the third, just about ready to put in the third layer there. And uh, this is another thing I wanted to to let you know. This client it has a big landscaping company, and and they had a lot of. Uh, road base and they wanted to put use the road base for the climate battery and and I I let them all right I said that was okay it does hold heat and moisture very well mm -hmm. but it does not uh, it won't do a good job of supporting big perennial roots mm -hmm. they swore that they'll never use it for that they want it's going to be an indoor community garden we arrange the beds as you'll see shortly uh, so that they're more like a just annual beds um, and so the raised beds have all the soil that the plants will need, um, but you know Rome likes to see at least the northwest corner <laughs> done in roots for the fig tree. There's the just a standard um, nexus frame. Uh, this is not an optical illusion. I did design this so that the bottom cord slopes a little bit so that we could run our our water tanks 
just run the hoses down the slope and drain them. And everybody went, that looks weird. I'm like, ah, you'll never, you'll, you'll never. They all slope. <laughs> they all slope. Wow. They all slope. So that the, we have the tanks up high over here, and then we can just, we can always drain the lines without having to blow them out. Um, and here, this is one of the features that we, we strive for in all of our greenhouses. Minimize glazing, maximize insulation. All right, you're not going to harvest sunlight here. You're not going to harvest much of it here. You're definitely not harvesting it on the north wall. Insulate those walls. Make them light and uh, reflective inside so the plants get lots of light. What did you use for insulation? Uh, those were uh, what are called uh, SIPS panels, which stands for Structural Insulated Panel System. It's, but they're uh, different because they don't have the, the board on right. the inside. There's uh, two kinds. There's a uh, um, one with an um, oriented strand border like plywood on both sides. So it's like a, an Oreo cookie. Um, and then because we have this steel frame, and I didn't want to expose the OSB board or plywood to the inside of the greenhouse, we just bought it with one side. The plywood's only on the outside, so you can attach your siding with screws anywhere you want. And on the inside, we could add more foam in between the steel columns get more insulating value in here, and then just cover it with a vapor barrier and metal. Mm -hmm. And the metal reflects all the light. You'll Is see all that. Is something else you could use instead of foam, or? Uh, you could use other other materials. You could use fiberglass, although right. um, not really. it's not a good moisture. idea to use. The, the really nice thing about this is that moisture doesn't go through it. Mm -hmm. Now, when moisture goes through insulation, uh, on, in a house, you know, and it does, it goes through the fiberglass insulation. You have to have ventilation up above that and underneath mm -hmm. the waterproof part of the roof so that you can get that moisture out. Otherwise, it soaks that fiberglass so thoroughly with water that it can't get out that eventually the fiberglass gets heavy, it gets con compressed at the bottom, and you, along the bottom of your, your ceiling at the edge where the roof meets it, You'll, you'll see water coming through. And also, so rats and shit will get the fiberglass. Yeah. And so this is a more benign. And, and this foam is made with oil. Uh, and it's expanded polystyrene. You can also use urethane. They're both made with at least partly uh, petroleum products. But we figure, well, this is a, this is a 100 year use of oil. Um, and it's, it's going for a good cause. So not to, I'm not worried about that too much. <coughs> There's the outside. Everything is just metal. Um, my funny or fun uh, roof. This is the method we use. We modify their trusses, put a little post under the bottom purlin so we could bend all the glazing out this way. So when we get a foot of snow and it starts to slide, it doesn't hang up on the gutter and keep us from getting our sunlight back. So it just slides off. We just get a little bit in there. Um, otherwise, when it's raining, the water goes right in the gutter and we get to collect it. If it's just a small amount of snow, most of it goes in the gutter and we get to collect it. But when it's a lot of snow, we have to get the sun back. There's the four big fans right along the bottom, three fish tanks. Uh, these are the um, initial layouts in rebar of the planting beds. Our climate control system, that controls the, oh, the vents, the automatic vents at the bottom and the top. Is that an agro? And uh, no, this is... Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, this is the Wadsworth. Oh, okay. What kind of fish were they planning on putting in the... Tank? The tilapia. The tilapia. And how are they feeding them? I'm not sure. Commercial. Adam will actually know more about that food. stuff than, <laughs> than I do. Commercial. Dog food, I think. Yeah, probably, yeah, probably dog food. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably some kind of fish food. Um, this is the outside of the building. Essentially, that you know, eventually have it all um, fixed. I wanted to show this photo because it was really interesting to me. It was last fall; it was getting cold outside. And it was at the actually very, very beginning of the winter when they set up the aquaponics system. And um, I had designed all these racks out of Unistrut, and each one was supposed to have a, a concrete block footing. Mm -hmm. They missed that one right there. That one did not have a footing. We didn't find out that that one didn't have a footing uh, when they were pumping the water from all three tanks up into the shelves, letting it drain through the, the clay. And overnight, this column settled 
this corner of the shelf lowered. The water in here went out that corner, past the tank, onto the ground where the footing should have been, mm. and the column sank deeper. Mm. The shelf fell lower. The water poured faster. And pretty soon, before morning, the tank was empty, and it looked like the coast of Maine inside the greenhouse. It was like uh, fog so thick you could cut it with a knife. So they propped it up, uh, filled the tank back up with water by the time I got there, and, uh, and then the builder came and put a footing under that one. It's funny how things connect. There it is all fixed up and with the climate with a lot less moisture in it. Is that the drip line going along the... Oh uh, yeah, these are the drip thing. lines going down to all the... And it also functions well because, you know, the drip, it all functions with uh, gravity from these tanks back up there. Wow. So she has all these potted yeah. plants up there as well. And um, I think there's some photos here of... Yeah, here she's got the, um, the tomatoes all going vertical. And she's now got them laying down on the ground and going vertical again. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> if this same greenhouse had been built without um, raised beds, but you had actually had soil, if you did it like what you did, Jerome, in uh, mm -hmm. Phoenix, and everything was planted in the ground, would you get a better yield out of there or about the same? I mean, what's the comparison? Well, for annuals, you really need raised beds. I mean, I grew, I grew annuals for a year right in the, the Phoenix soil before I converted into polyculture. Uh, so you can actually, if you if you do what I do is continually mulching, but she doesn't. She, you know, the biointensive people they just add, they just grow in compost, and then when they need more nutrients, they just add more compost. They don't make soil as a regular basis like we're doing in, in Phoenix, where you're just adding mulches and adding little manures and and, and then just watching the succession. This is an, an, an annual production. And so, you know, there are two different worlds. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, this is it from the outside. Eventually, I mean, they haven't done a, a thing for this subdivision because the market is so poor uh, mm -hmm. for real estate right now, especially in this area. And, uh, but eventually there will be, this, this greenhouse will be surrounded with uh, community gardens inside a fence and a this is the old barn that will be, become a community center. Uh, and then over here there will be a, an outdoor kitchen. So, <coughs> you know, like covered with where you'll be able to go there, cook and dine. And outdoor beds all through this area, about an acre of outdoor beds. Um, could you repeat where you said that was? It's, it's, no, this one is, is uh, on the way to Carbondale. It's on the oh, back road to Carbondale. It's right near the Waldorf School. Waldorf School oh, is just okay. upstream from it. Yeah. 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 Um, and there it is from the meadow. It'll, it'll, it, uh, I love the way it looks right now um, without all the houses. And we worked for about six months um, designing this in, 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 with a team of planners and a whole bunch of people around a table every week. We had meetings. I, I was responsible for making the soils that went in there, and gathering different materials, composting. Hired, I hired the gardener. Mm -hmm. uh, because I knew they needed they needed a production person, so I stole somebody away from one of the production greenhouses down the alley, and uh, she's working out great. She's yep. exactly what they need to do what they're doing. Now we were designing these climate batteries based on what I was taught by John Crickshank, who, with Jerome, really pioneered this simple technology, and. Uh, at first, I just started taking it a little further by using the horizontal manifolds and, and the bigger fans and um, kind of tuning the controls. Then I began to realize, especially because we were writing a book about all this in hopes that in future people will be able to pick up the book and, and practice this on their own. And in order to kind of expand it, expand the knowledge of it, I began to, to look into, well, what is, what are the climates we're trying to create in here? What are the characteristics of those climates? And, and in what outdoor climates are we trying to create that? So trying to get uh, an understanding of the dynamics of our atmosphere, the air, uh, the, the moisture in the air, 
and uh, and how those two things together um, take on heat and give off heat. And so I'm just uh, showing that you know here is uh, a project we're working on right now, the Knapp Ranch, and you can't really see it. I could I could zoom in on it a little bit, uh, but the but up here I basically identified it. The Knapp Ranch is right here in these two zones, DFB and DFC, and the Koppen Geiger Climate Classification System. And those are uh, snow, fully humid, warm summer, or cool summer. It's right in between those two. And it's, in, it's tucked in a valley on the north side of the Holy Cross Wilderness, <coughs> where a ton of water comes down mm. through their ranch. And it's actually quite lush there. Uh, so it's not. It may be between fully humid and and uh, you know, summer dry, but it gets a ton of winter snow. So it's somewhere in that realm. And what we're trying to uh, develop in a place like that is a greenhouse that will support an equatorial climate, fully humid, like Jerome has in Phoenix. And everyone is familiar with this map, I'm sure, of growing zones. And these are, the, these are the temperature characters of all of these growing zones. So uh, the coldest in the lower 48 would be the very northern tip of Maine, uh, although that has some different character to it because it's so close to the coast. And uh, Minnesota, northern Minnesota, where we have, we're down in the two and three uh, Zones plus the Tetons and North. And with climate yeah, change, these little spots here, 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 and 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 here the Central Rocky Mountains. Yeah, uh, that goes Aspen. And there's actually uh, the map is not quite accurate. Right up here is Steamboat Springs, another yeah. cold spot. And there another cold spot. They're lower elevation, but colder than mm -hmm. we are. Um, and so it's I think it's important to understand all of those things plus. <laughs> this other layer, which is annual precipitation. So I began to study what is the natural annual precipitation, and I found that, that uh, this little green uh, lobster right here yeah. is actually the central Rocky Mountains of Colorado, uh, beginning with the uh, collegiate wilderness, the uh, snowmass maroon belt wilderness, the hunter frying pan, and the holy cross wildernesses. Uh, mm -hmm. And the Knapp Ranch is right on the northern edge of that. So, and that area is getting uh, about 24 inches of water where in all these, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm telling you the wrong thing. The, um, it's the browner areas that are up here, that are uh, the mountain areas. But anyway, they get, um, they get a higher level of moisture than we do down in the valley floors. If I zoom in on this chart here, you'll see what I mean. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go there. My computer is a little bit slow, but uh, okay. So, yeah, here we are in the, these darker brown areas. So we're right in here, about uh, or right in these two, 25 yeah. approximately inches, right. And then the irrigation water rights that they have on that ranch are actually about 30 to 35 acre feet or inches. Uh, so about um, uh, almost three acre feet mm. per acre. Um, and they're right up in this area, right up in here. So it's important, I think, to understand the moisture because now we can determine that Okay, you have, a, you have about 25 inches naturally. If you can apply another 30 inches to your ground, you can grow lush alfalfa and haze, and you can grow annuals, and you can do a lot of things. And then it just depends forest on... Forest gardens. Your, and forest gardens. And, you can, and it just depends on, on um, how much water you actually have. Um, more, more than it depends on the soil. You can build soil, but you can't create water. So then it led me into uh, trying to, and this is part of the book we're writing as well. This is a chart for the crop protection mm -hmm. strategies. And what I did here was to take the climate history, daily climate history, uh, for a given few years for a lot of different areas. One in way northern Minnesota, zone two, 
and another one way southern Florida, Miami, zone 10 or 11, and uh, say, okay, what are, the, what are the daily minimums and maximums and precipitation amounts and humidity levels that each of these climates have? And you can see, I've got the chart um, that I'm working on in here. Uh, let me see. So let's, let's go to zone 2. I'll pull zone 2 up, and you can see that I, I go get this data, and it's actually, you know, this is what happened on those days. You can go back and look. And so the temperature, the minimum on February 1st, 2010 was minus 13, and the maximum was 10.4, above zero. Uh, and there's a 23 degree difference between those two. Um, yet when I'm looking at the uh, zone 11 in Florida, actually these, these records were taken in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So mm -hmm. let's, let's accurately say it's Cuba. Uh, and so I'm calling it zone 11. I, I think that's accurate for Cuba. But their minimum temperature on that day was 70, and their maximum was 86. They have very little difference between day and night. So they're surrounded by ocean. So the ocean is what's like our water tank in the greenhouse. It's keeping things pretty even. And when you look down the whole chart in that column of difference between night and day, you're finding that there's not much. Where there is some, where, where, there, where there's not, where there's the least amount, we're seeing there's moisture happening. Mm -hmm. So the air is getting more dense because it's holding more, more humidity. And therefore it's able to hold more heat through the night when the sun is gone. And so those are the kinds of things that we're seeing happening there. And then we're also noticing that, that the temperature in Cuba, you know, it, here's like a maximum a maximum, 93.2, where in the desert here, it gets up to 110. Um, you know, and when it's, and when it's 93.9, I think this is the highest one, and it happened twice, it's in September. So there's like a lag. It's not at summer solstice like it is here in our thin air. There's a mm -hmm. lag behind it. So this, this, this heat stays, it, it collects and it stays. Uh, the ocean gets warm, builds up heat. Mm. Exactly, yeah. The maximums keep rising until quite late in the year. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're trying to do with the climate batteries. We're trying to yeah, exactly. the humidity in the soil. So what I'm finding here is I'm making this chart to say, all right, um, we have these different ways of doing crop protection. All right? If we just, rather than saying, let's build a four-season permanent greenhouse with a big climate battery in it uh, in any climate, Let's evaluate what each climate needs. And so mm -hmm. here's our zones, 1 through 12. Here's our months, February through, or January through December. And here's our crop protection strategies. A blue one, I'm calling open sky, uh, but in need of shade structures, mm -hmm. greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, out, here's one outdoor, open sky growing. You know, you're, this is, you're in your growing season, and, and you're not worried about frost. Temperatures are above 40 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Uh, when they're only above 30 degrees Fahrenheit, you want to have some row covers. When they're above 20 degrees, you can maybe get by with some hoop houses. Uh, when they're above 10 degrees, we see that there's a farmer in Montrose who gets by all winter with row covers inside of hoop houses. We do too in southern yeah. Indiana. The chart's very accurate. Classified zone six. Okay. You use those mm -hmm. strategies, they work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then here's an insulated greenhouse without a climate battery. And I'm going to show you an example of one of these in a, in a minute um, that someone else did and that I admire a great deal. Uh, and it's, a, but temperatures are generally above zero degrees Fahrenheit at night as a minimum. And then an insulated greenhouse with a climate battery, we've demonstrated here in the Rocky Mountains, we can, we can that'll take care of business. Uh, above minus 30. When you're in between minus 20 and minus 30, you do need a little backup heat sometimes, but you can build it robust enough to get it, get you there. Now, uh, then I started to apply this to this chart, and I put colors on so you could see it, that in zone one, and I actually, I couldn't find climate data for Fairbanks, Alaska, so I'm guessing at this, but zone two is, uh, is um, Hillings or in, Hibbing, Minnesota. Yeah, Hibbing. That's it. Hibbing, Minnesota. Where Bob Dylan came from. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere near there. <laughs> he left very young. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I'm finding, and I went through this very carefully to see what their temperatures were and how they correspond to this these months, and I'm finding that July and August are the months when you're sure not to be in frost. In June, you're still getting days that are at 30 degrees Fahrenheit, or nights at 30 degrees Fahrenheit, so you're still getting frost in June. And then, you know, each of these different solutions can work here. So our climate battery, what this is telling me, is that we're really you know, needing the climate battery in zones two through four, uh, one through four, if we ever get an opportunity to do something in a zone one. Um, two through four are the ones we're really going to be in. But as soon as we get into zones five, six, seven, we can tell people, you don't need to spend that much money. You can do something a little simpler. And, you know, then we can also, this will also spur us to develop other strategies to again drive the price down while keeping the performance going up. So I'm starting to drag on here. This is the example of, uh, of these, these guys in Boulder that I admire. They did this greenhouse, um, it's called Synergistic Building Technology, <coughs> is the name of their company. And this is all SIPS panels, all these wall surfaces, the roofs here and the roof here. But this is really kind of kind of brilliant. Uh, what they've done is they have very minimal windows and no windows on roofs, only walls. The, uh, these upper windows are where most of the sunlight comes into the building in the winter. But they've amplified it by making, first they insulated by providing shutters made out of foam panels that swing up against the ceiling. And the surface of those panels that faces outdoors when they're down is a silver foil. So when they hoist them up to the ceiling in the back, and then they have a white roofing material on this roof here, the sun, the low sun in the winter bounces off of that, bounces off of that, and they have tons of indirect sunlight inside. And then at night they get to close these panels down, keep these windows from losing much heat, and then they have these in addition down here. These are exterior panels that flip down uh, and they just used these for reflection to get sunlight in, and they ended up with these double insulated wall with a with a, a pocket where a, a panel, an insulated panel, comes down inside the glass to insulate yes. these bottom ones. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, you should make these guys go up yeah. and and just come down during the day to reflect the light and and just you know hinge up at, at night. But what they learned was that they didn't need a climate battery to go all the way through the winter growing tomatoes. Um, but what they needed was uh, carbon dioxide. <coughs> they, their plants were starved for carbon dioxide because they, were, they weren't ventilating at all um, mm -hmm. inside the greenhouse. I think they were starved for direct light too. And, and they, it wasn't as, they, the plants were not as robust as they grow at Jerome's, but you know, very few are, actually. <laughs> people, you know, we don't have very many people that really understand what's going on like Drone does. So the plant, I always figure, well, the plants are suffering because they, they missed well, Jerome. This is a <laughs> this is a one-year prototype. So yeah, you know, and it's they'll very interesting stuff. It, yeah. But they only grew one year of annuals, one winter of annuals, yeah. Yeah. and uh, you know, so. As prototypes go, it has a lot of interesting things. They came yeah. here and took our workshop. We gave them a tour. So we're kind of swapping information. Uh, but, you know, what I, I mean, I just think that they're backing themselves in the corner with not, not with trying to do, use all this indirect light. They're, they're, they're only looking at one, one factor is insulation and indirect light. When we can do the same thing with all this direct lighting, and grow tropical perennials. So, I mean, it, you, know, you can go down this road, but at the end of the road, you may not be anywhere, because we've seen prototypes come and go, and they spent, and people, you know. Yeah. So, let's... Uh, well, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, exactly. and I just wanted to show, show this, because I'm, what I'm seeing is that, uh, you know, there's many ways to skin this cat. Uh, How these did are, they determine that the problem was carbon dioxide? Their plants were suffering, and they brought in no some. They brought in some they... some scientists from CSU. Oh wow! And they came in Jeez. and they said, "Well, this looks like carbon dioxide starvation." 
I should have brought the picture. Or opening the door. <laughs> or uh, I told I, we told him, well, you know, you could always have spinning class in here. And, and, uh, and that led me to the idea that you know we need a we need a fixed in place bicycle with a blender attached you know, down at three years. Down at three years. <laughs> So you can have your smoothies up, you know. No, actually, they're, they, spent, they spent about the same amount per square foot that we did on that. Um, I think they could have done it better, and I think they could have done it with a different reflecting strategy that didn't have that big mass of wall and roof. This piece right from here to here, in the way of the sunlight. Um, I mean, they really did get, they have a lot of shade in the summer, and that's the other thing I worry about mm -hmm. is that the plants aren't getting hardly any. There's like one little band of sunlight uh, in the middle of the greenhouse of direct sunlight, and I mm -hmm. think the plants um, move all, all move toward that, yeah. you know, and then they get yeah. all crowded in the middle yeah, of the my, my uh, experience that people try to grow tomatoes in in. In a greenhouse that doesn't have any overhead light, direct light, um, they don't fruit, and figs don't mm. fruit that way. Yeah. So I'm wondering if they really um, understand that. So I mean, and that's why they're coming here because they yeah. don't know how to grow plants. So they're coming here to yeah. get in more information. So you know, whether all this indirect light, but we would, we're like, we're we're using indirect light too when yeah. we get ourselves back into a corner. So we can learn something from what they're doing. Right, and we we also notice that they're. You know, their tomato plants were really long and leggy. If you were to measure according to length of stalk, how many buds, mm -hmm. you know, how many flowers are on. I didn't see any tomatoes on there. I saw some, I saw flowers, but they weren't as dense as yours. So I think it's, a, you know, it's important to, and I, I don't think they were doing any work in the soil. So it wasn't no, really, it, was just it wasn't terrible. apples and apples, you know, <laughs> it was, right. it was very like, different. It so was like a paint, like a... A parking lot. Yeah, it was. Yeah, they were after. They were after. This is what they were trying to do. Is to, and they took these charts to show you, you know, temperature inside the hoop. They had one, you know, one little layer of small air tubes in the ground, fed by literally a six-inch pipe, six-inch diameter pipe, and a tiny little fan. And they were able to take these temperature readings. So the dashed, uh, the brown is the soil, of course, and the Dashed is the is the temperature of the soil hoop, uh, and the uh, brown is uh, wait a minute, how did that work? Time and air and soil. The this, the blue one is the air, and the and the brown one is the is the soil. And so this is outside, and this is inside. Wait, the hoop is a hoop house or what? Uh, what is the hoop? The hoop is their uh, tubing. There's another. Okay, and then they have the climate batteries. Inside deal. No. There are little climate batteries, and, and this one temperature. Course. And this here is the temperature of the air outside. Right here. Hmm. And then here's the uh, record of the cold snap that we had at the end of January, beginning of February. And you can see that what's really going on here is that the soil in the greenhouse is following this line here. And so it's, it's you know, fairly even. And that's really the goal, is to keep, keep your your soil and your plant uh, atmosphere in a in a, a tight range. This is a, a large commercial building that we uh, it's going on in in Elgebel where there's a greenhouse here, and um, uh, we do we're doing a climate battery there that's a slightly different size than this one because these three bays of, is all greenhouse structure but only this bay actually has glazing. These two bays are covered with opaque roofing, and um, and we're doing something interesting here. This battery is going to serve these three bays as one big open space. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing here that I wanted mm -hmm. to show you is um, this idea that we got from looking at a, a project in, in South Carolina. Um, I should give my computer, I'm trying to move this thing over. It's um, Here's the retail climate battery. So uh, it's got the intake side right here, two manifolds, two horizontal manifolds that end in the middle. So there's a gap there and a cap. And basically, we're putting dampers in inside and outside. The blue ones are outside. The 
the yellow ones are inside. And then this register picks up warm air from the indoor space up high. When the indoor damper is open, the fan is down in here. It pulls that air, that hot moist air, and runs it through the battery in the normal way, and it comes out here. Now we can shut that damper off. The idea is we, we use these dampers open in the late summer through the fall to bring the temperature of the battery up into the 70s or as close to 80 as we can get it. And then we go through the winter exchanging the cooler air in the, in the airspace through this same system. Now as we exit winter, and we don't need the climate battery so much anymore, we're in April, uh, then we can approach winter, summer solstice, the hot part of the year, by at night time closing off the indoor dampers, opening the outdoor dampers, and at night pulling in outdoor air with the same fan, driving it through the tubing, and exiting it outside, thereby dropping the temperature of the battery down close to 60 degrees. Because our, we in this area, in our region, we have between 30 and 40 degrees of temperature difference between day and night, just because of the altitude we're at. So we can use it as a refrigerator, is essentially what I'm getting at. So this is a, a refrigerator leading into summer, and it's a heater leading into winter. So it's a true battery. They're going to love this in, in Chelsea Green, aren't they? I think so. Yes. <laughs> and anyway, then these are sections, and then I put in, this is a permit drawing, so I put in all the climate calculations and heat loss calculations and everything that we, that we did for this uh, to them. Um, I don't want to go into that right now. And this is the grow house in, in Denver. And uh, there, Adam and Kobe pioneered this, this idea of the, of the fan down inside of the, the tubing. And, um, and that's the example there. It's on springs. And I'm not yet sure if we don't, if we don't get any sort of backflow here hmm. along the sides. And if we do, uh, then you can remove the top cover um, and put in a, a like a fabric or something that, that gets attached to the edge so that you're only driving air down. I'm not sure yet how that will work, but I think Kobe found the spring that did the job there. Mm -hmm. And the temperature sensors that were buried in the ground there. And then uh, these are uh, just some other examples that I'm still striving to, to see. As long as you can get a structure that will hold the snow, if you have snow, mm -hmm. um, you can take a, a simple uh, greenhouse through the winter. Uh, so there's a high tunnel mm -hmm. um, with opening sides but no ridge vent. Um, you're all probably familiar with the Rolling Thunder. This is a common greenhouse made by International Greenhouse Corporation. Nexus has a similar one. Um, there's quite a few companies that build these, these truss systems and then have either operable vents here, this is a manual, uh, and you can even do, like they did at the grow house, a filter screen where you can pour water through it and pull the air in through a water screen. Um, and then this is the Elkstone greenhouse. This is the expensive child uh, uh, that was all custom inside. Uh, and, but this building takes a lot of snow. It, um, I think they, they had snow up above the gutter. They had to plow out with a, with a skid steer twice this past winter. Uh, and this is the one where we developed that little, that little curvy thing that helps the snow to slide off. And then we did also a caretaker building for them with a commercial kitchen downstairs. And a caretaker apartment above and an office. Uh, so they were really setting up a, a rather elaborate farm. This is the steel pipe sculpture that is the grape trellis. Um, that is one fancy grape trellis. Yeah, that was a, that was a pretty. The, the 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 welder loved me for that. <laughs> he retired. He retired. Yeah. 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 We all should retire. The snowmobile too. Yeah. And the other trellis, I'm not going to show you, this buried in there, uh, over the two north tanks. And I grew all the plants out for that greenhouse, and at the same time I was building. Right. 
or fig. Beans. Then if you, anyone is interested in those, in the climate information for your region, uh, you can go to the Farmer's Almanac site. That's where I collect it. Uh, it doesn't cover, there's areas I wish it could cover, like Canada and, and, and Mexico, um, but at least they got Cuba. Uh, anyway, the... Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but you can go there, go and you can go to their customized weather data, and it costs you a whopping $10 a year to subscribe to that and then you don't need a password it just recognizes your computer so you you know you can only use it from one computer but you can go in there and just put in the zip code or go to the map and just click on the map for the area you want to study and it'll take you to this whole chart which shows you all these little all these little bar charts of the temperature the precipitation the wind speeds etc and you can download the raw data to pull it right into uh, Excel into a spreadsheet and use it like I did there to, Where is it again? Uh, oh, yeah, it's uh, Farmer's Almanac, oh, yeah. and I think it's almanac.com, I think is the, is the actual address. Right, we just cut all of this rye. It was, it was sort of planted as a cover crop to hold the soil there. But it's also a green crop. I mean, just got it cut the other day, and now they're going to trash it and use it for bread making during that. Now, one, one of the things that we're going to talk about the last day is that of how to make a living, and uh, you know, I uh, when I you know, Michael was an architect for you know a, a traditional architect building trophy homes and commercial buildings for 25 years, and he couldn't take it anymore. Uh, <laughs> and this he got out just in time when the recession hit, and pretty much every every office laid everybody off. Anyway, wow. so we he, two years before that we were struggling to get this co company, you know up to where he was making a living for a little bit anyway. Um, and so, if, as a permaculturist, it's always good to, to, to find some other profession that you can you know, partner with. Because we, mm -hmm. you know, we have some skills, uh, there's more general skills, but if we can work with professionals who already have his foot in the door, like he, he signs contracts, he knows how to smooth, you know, he spends two, Spent two years getting a contract for some of these wealthy clients because they're very particular. We don't have those skills as permaculturists. <laughs> 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 no, we don't have the uh, the money. degrees or credentials. <laughs> so uh, I encourage you to find you know, partners, partnerships uh, some to, time, some to, to, to use whatever you learn here and, and what other skills you have that you've already accumulated uh, if you want to make permaculture into a livelihood. You know, the, the, a lot of architects, just like all the food, food production companies are running to organic, architects are running to lead and green and sustainable mm -hmm. and renewable energy. And buildings are one of the mm -hmm. biggest wasters of, of uh, energy in the world, in, in our cultures. And so, you know, architects are all, you know, heavily leaning, if not running, in that direction. And we really need, as the preface in, in this book out here that's required reading for your class says, you know, they have a list and everything has design in it, you know, design for all, all species and take all species into account and take all of the, uh, take nature into account completely when designing. And, the, and you know, and we need to do that with everything. So architects need permaculture partners. And landscape architects need permaculture partners. I know of many, many landscape architects that don't know anything about edible perennials or mm -hmm. edible annuals. Mm -hmm. They know a lot about um, they know a lot produce. about ornamental plants. They know a lot yeah, about how ornamental plant guilds and yeah. communities yeah. work together. Um, but they don't know a lot about soil. And you know, soil and water are the magic ingredients of everything. So um, and we partnered with a landscape planner, uh, in fact, a group of three people who also got laid off from design workshop after the, the crash, and they started their own little firm, and <laughs> through John Crookshank, we, we had a really big project down in, in, in Arizona, and we sent them down there to do all the preliminary stuff that landscape planners do, and they, they 
created a book, a big copy of a book for this project, which is about this thick. All the mapping, all of the species on here, everything, and then, and then we come in and do the fine detail of the permaculture stuff. And they're learning as, as we go along. In fact, I'm going to have uh, Giles and his partners come here for the party and bring the book. Yeah. And so That's we can look idea. at that. So we can take permaculture to this much, much higher level by partnering. We're not going to learn those skills ourselves. You know, you know, we're going to have to go to five years of university and we have to do that. So well, some of you, some of you have it. You have engineers here, but you know, if an engineer has permaculture, then he partners with somebody else who, who doesn't, and then, and then that's why we have you know this big this big project in Arizona, and it, it was just a, it was, it, it just happened sort of organically. But yeah. it, uh, and this this project in Arizona, just one little side note to it, it's it's sort of magical. You wouldn't think that it could be anything because when you walk out on this 320 acres, it's desert. It is, you know, yucca and cactus and... What part of Arizona? Pinyon juniper, really. Pinyon juniper, yeah. Uh, northern Arizona, north of mm. the mountains, uh, around Taylor. Around about the five, Taylor. 5,000 feet. A couple of Mormon communities there, farming. And it sits, this area sits on top of the highest point of the largest aquifer in the southwest. <laughs> and he, 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 goes out, he goes out, he drills down 50 to 80 feet. 200 gallons a day. Like, oh my god. We're, we're here in the mountains, we drill right in the middle of the creek and we might get three gallons a day. <laughs> yeah. you know? And then there are several ponds already on it. And yeah, he's got ponds going. Yeah. And then I begin to wonder, you know, when you bring in, a, in an environment like that where you're at probably 7% humidity yeah. mm -hmm. and, and 105 degrees occasionally, and he actually gets up in the high 90s and you, you open up this groundwater, you put it in a big pond, you know, how, and there's a 40 mile an hour wind going through there. Bye bye, baby. Bye bye, water. And I wonder, you know, will it be 20 years, 50 years before you really notice a, you need to redrill your wells, or just how, you know, how much of an effect can we have if we're, if we I have a that, lot? I doubt that that 300 acres would use anything near what a sanitary operation right. would use. Right. So we're going to conserve the water by, you know. Right using drip, and there's lots of agricultural land in the bottom land. It's right. beautiful soil. You just put water on it, anything grows. But, it's, but you know, we're going to be designing it for minimal use. It'll, we're going to work on it in, in a way like uh, as if Henry Ford uh, really strived for 80 miles a gallon with the Model T. Because yeah. um, <laughs> that's where we're at, sort of. We're really <laughs> recognizing that if we, if we start, even though he has 200 gallons a minute, if we, you know, start out using designing everything for a trickle, then it'll go forever. Mm -hmm. Perhaps um, it'll be a good example. It'll be a good example anyway. Is that a greenhouse or outside? What do you do? Uh, a variety of things. There's one section of the of the acres there. We're going to start with an animal husbandry operation, uh, a, a caretaker abode, which will start out as a as a. Uh, as a beat up old RV uh, and end up with this this uh, solar sense it's called solar sense house it's made out of panels it comes prefabricated and we'll design a, a little <coughs> greenhouse attached to that uh, there will also be uh, a greenhouse just below the big pond so that we can tap that water right away it's faces south we can use the greenhouse to lift the wind uh, up and before it goes over the pond, we can put some, some horizontal turbine, wind turbines on there to generate some electricity. He's already got out there a big 12-kilowatt uh, 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 photovoltaic system that it pumps, the water. That pumps the water into, up they already have a, into the ponds. We already have a pit dug for the greenhouse, so right. we're, we're going to put a 140-foot by something right. greenhouse. And then, you know, we'll use behind those turbines, there will be, you know, Probably when when Drone does this, a succession of plants, perennials that you know will continue to lift that wind over the pond, so we maybe can not get so much um, loss there, and also to establish a lot of root systems so that pond never leaks and just wipes out the greenhouse. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of things to consider, but the, before we even got there, this this guy, you know, he he's so anxious, he bought all this equipment at some some auction, some, 
excavator went out of business and he, he has this whole pile of uh, scrapers and loaders and back oh, yeah. so, I mean, the guy's so, smart. He, 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 um, he, he got all of the, the, the tools to build this project. And he's going about it in a very methodical way. Right, but he's but he's, in this case he got he, that pond and the he excavated for a greenhouse that isn't designed yet. So <laughs> I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I know, I know Armageddon is tomorrow, but come on. Come on here. He was just here before you a couple of weeks ago yeah. um, to a visit. He was here just one day before the course, I think it was. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.